Greetings. Hi, -ya. it's the new year, 2020. Hmm. Too bad my eyes won't match those numbers anymore. Yeah, I hope you all had a good new year. Uh, I sure did. Uh, sitting on the lanai out front over here. Fireworks are legal in Hawaii. We had thousands of skyrockets. <laughs> it was a oh, childlike wonder for me. I swear, it was amazing. Yeah, so I had a good year so far. We're in day two. Today's Ellen's birthday. Uh, I got to get back to that soon, but I decided to take a break and shoot a video because I've had quite a few questions lately from people or requests. Uh, people asking me to do videos about farming in Hawaii or about farming in general. Uh, so I, I put on my uh, farming shirt here. Uh, there we have. Uh, Mr. Natural, riding on his tractor. Uh, yes, sir. <sighs> well, yeah, the truth of the matter is, I think it's most folks who actually really go into farming and make it, they're probably born into it. In other words, mom, dad, they were farmers, it's a family thing, and you kind of just go into that business. Um, it's really a very difficult way to make a living. If, if, if what you're interested in is an in income, I would highly recommend uh, <laughs> becoming a lawyer. Uh, get educated as a nurse. Um, uh, open a bookstore. I don't know anything else except for uh, going into farming. Uh, in general, uh, it tends to be a fairly poor way to make a living. Uh, the last depression in the 1930s actually started during the mid-1920s on the farms. Uh, and so the farms were the first ones to be affected. You know, those, that, those are the downsides, I guess. Uh, you know, people have a tendency to romanticize this, uh, I think. Really, you know, out sitting on your tractor in the field in the sun, you know, all your chickens clucking at you or something like that. Um, well, you know, a crop failure due to foul weather or uh, pests is not romantic, you know. Shoveling two tons of manure to feed the crops and clean the chickens, not at all romantic. There are many aspects of this that uh, uh, they ain't a whole hell of a lot of fun, frankly. Um, you know, it's, you're dealing with problems constantly. And another issue is, too, is that, you know, I'm sure many of the people asking me this have gone into the, the conventional route for employment in the United States. You know, maybe you get a college degree, you know, you, uh, you run a few jobs in a hamburger stand, write in a resume, and then finally maybe get a job with some business someplace. Um, you know, it's going to give you a decent living wage and some benefits and so on. This is typical. Uh, and in cases like this, um, you're pretty much taken care of by your employer, all right? And so farming is a business f for more of an entrepreneurial spirit because um, you're on your own. You're on your own. You know, farmers don't get unemployment compensation. They don't get paid vacations, you know. Um, they, they have to pay into Social Security and Medicare, so, but when they do they pay twice what you folks do who are working for somebody you know, because your employer pays the other half of all that. The farmer pays the full thing. Uh, you know, uh, We don't get a lot of the social benefits. All right? There are um, some things you know that other workers don't get. Uh, go away fly. <laughs> Very funny. He wants to get in the picture. Um, you know, I mean, there are farm loans, there are, there's disaster relief, there are things, you know, specifically for farmers, too. Um, so you're not completely alone out there, but uh, it's pretty much, it's your own bootstraps, man. You want to make it uh, as a farmer, if you decide that that's what you're going to do for a living, uh, you're going to be pulling your own weight. That's all there is to it. Nobody is going to set up a formula for you and say, here, this is it, walk in the door, get started. It's not like that at all. Um, it will have to do 
you know, with perhaps the sort of business your parents and grandparents had set up if you're a generational farmer, um, you know, or uh, you're going to have to be very creative and start from the ground floor and start to build this business for yourself. Um, now, for most of the people that are talking to me, I'm sure, uh, your position in farming, if there is one, it will really be in niche agriculture. You're, you're not going to be out there growing fields of wheat like most of those guys indebted to the bank in Kansas, you know, who have 10,000 acres under the plow or something, uh, and they can make a living off of it, barely, uh, because of the quantity they produce. You're probably working on smaller parcels of land, um, you may not be going to the bank or the government to get loans. Um, you know, I, I guess I did, uh, uh, you know, go to the bank for a loan on some of this property here originally, but no longer. This is owned, and so I, I don't rely on the government or the commercial banking system to be able to continue doing what I'm doing here. <clears throat> and so, and it's my suggestion, um, stay as light as possible if you think you're going into farmer when it comes to debt load. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, it'll kill you. It will kill you, for sure. Because uh, farming is not necessarily a highly profitable business. That's... Uh, I guess that's not why people go into it, you know. Uh, niche farming can be, you know, I've probably previously said occasionally uh, about some of the people I've known in life, you know, who working on an acre and a half were generating uh, over a million dollars a year gross. Uh, you can do that, but it depends on whether or not you're creative enough to think of what is the next big thing. I mean, that's basically it. What are people looking for? What do they want? You know, uh, where is it going, right? Yeah, that's, that's what it's all about. And if you can be there with what's needed at the time that they want it. Uh, see, a lot of farming has so much to do with other people looking around and going, well, what are the neighbors doing here, you know? You know, Wisconsin, for instance, where I lived for many years, known as a dairy state, it's on the license plates, and we have a tremendous amount of people there producing milk and cheese and butter and so on. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a reasonable way to make a living in that environment. It uh, happened <laughs> uh, just because of uh, immigration companies is how this really got going in the early part of the 20th century. Um, but then during the Depression, the immigration companies all went bankrupt, and so uh, people who were working on those lands ended up, you know, owning them a lot of times, and the immigration companies ran uh, a dairy business, is how that all got going, you know, pretty much one person follows the other into this, and... So if you're, you know, in Iowa and everybody around you is growing corn, well, if you decide that that's the thing to do, well, you're going to have thousands and thousands of other people doing exactly the same thing you're doing. Uh, and you'll be caught within that market as the corn crop is big, the corn crop is low, you know, and with the profits and so on. And there'll be times where the money you borrowed to, for the seed and the fertilizers and that to do the crop uh, will be beyond what you can make on that crop. All right. Um, all right, that is the downsides, I guess. Uh, the upsides, well, you get independence. Most of the time you're on your own. <laughs> but you do have a certain amount of freedom, uh, I guess. Um, being out there in the sun on your tractor, <laughs> yeah, there's a certain bit to that. Agriculture is ancient. Um, you know, so it does take us back to the beginning of time and it grounds us in things that humans have been doing for a long, long, long time. And so it adds a certain amount of meaning to life. Uh, I think for some of us it runs in the blood. Uh, in my case, uh, genetic assays indicate I belong to a almost extinct group of human beings that actually were the first people to ever start agriculture. So my ancestors were the first farmers on earth. Um, you know, and I'm myself only a generation or so uh, off the farm. I still had relatives in the family 
that uh, had pretty much retired from farming when I was born, but the farm still existed, and that lifestyle still existed, and I guess that's where my contact comes. So to an extent, with a gap, farming for me is part of a family business, uh, so I'm sort of a tradition. It runs, I, I think, in the blood. The desire to do it is just there. I feel good when I'm out there doing this thing. It seems right. And for me, it has been reasonably profitable. You know, but I'm, I'm not the kind of a guy that usually asks other people what I should be doing. Uh, I do seek advice and information from sources I consider to be reputable. I ask questions about farming frequently to the University of Hawaii, for instance. I, I do that frequently. I generally trust the answers I get back from them as being valid <laughs> as to the best of our understanding. Uh, you know, but yeah, along with, uh, you know, freedom goes as uh, uh, me and Bobby McGee, you know, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Uh, that you, you have very little of a safety net when you're on the farm between you and complete failure. Uh, that's really that's really the truth. Um, so, now, in specific, when it comes to farming in Hawaii, uh, I've gotten all kinds of questions and, uh, and, and stuff about <laughs> about this. That a lot of it really it doesn't connect. Um, you don't need any official paperwork to be a farmer. Okay, <laughs> you just get up one morning and say, "I'm going to start farming." All right, so. First, you need the motivation, All right? And then you're probably going to need the finances to start the venture. Yeah, you know, where you get them is up to you. You can go to a bank. Uh, maybe you own the land already, you know. Maybe you're gonna borrow it from your relatives. I don't know where you're gonna get the money. You can go to the government and make a farm loan. My, uh, my good friend Greg Adams here with the Dragon Fruit Farm and then later Exotic Tree Farm um, and now Lava Farm, because <laughs> Greg got covered in the volcano. But Greg, uh, he was a uh, skilled at writing uh, grant proposals uh, with the government and so he was able to convince them that starting the dragon fruit farm was worth them putting money behind and so he got a farm loan but it did take him uh, proving you know especially if you're planning to be a niche farmer like Greg is um, you know he didn't do coffee like a lot of the guys there on the island uh, he was probably the only other dragon fruit farmer here in the islands when he started this project and so convincing uh, our, our ag department here that this actually was a real crop that money could be made off of you know um, he had to jump through some hoops and oh, no, he's good at this he has an education background that uh, lends him towards writing proposals and grants uh, and so if you're good at that kind of thing you know, put it to work. You're going to need it because finances will definitely be important. Um, otherwise, there aren't any like permits or licenses or really much of anything at all that goes with this business. Um, you have to pay your taxes, and so you're going to list yourself with the IRS and the state of Hawaii as a farmer and declare your profits and losses uh, under that format. Uh, it will help if you get educated on the tax codes because there's an awful lot of advantages there. These are some of the positives about being a farmer, um, you know, because the farmer lives on the farm. And so a lot of things that for us would not be a tax write-off as a farmer can be. You know, fixing the road coming in on the farm, for instance, that's an integral part of the structure, and some of that can be written off. You you can't write your driveway off uh, usually, if uh, you know you're a lawyer, uh, and, and so on. So you want to become familiar with tax codes, and the easiest way to do that really is buy yourself one of the really good pieces of software, like Tax Cut or you know some of these, uh, where most of the work is laid out there for you. And all you got to do is follow it, read it, you know, and uh, so, you know, learning to play the tax game, 
but you're not going to need a whole lot of paperwork. Nobody says, oh, you know, you have an official paper that says, I'm a farmer. No, it doesn't work like that. Uh, you just get up one morning and you say, this is what I'm going to do. So then once you have finances to be able to get into the project and you understand how you're going to have to write off your profits and losses from what you're doing, uh, you have to acquire a space, whether you're renting it, which a lot of people do, uh, or maybe you're borrowing it. Who knows? Uh, I have done that. I've borrowed land before in the past. Um, you know, sometimes uh, just controlling the weeds on property for someone else uh, can give you the property for your use, you know, if you're growing on it. That happens. Um, you know, or you own the land. I own the land here, all right? Probably about the only way I could lose it, I guess, is if I stopped paying the taxes on it, for the most part, because I don't owe any money to anybody here on this. And so, th and that's an ideal situation if you are a Hawaiian farmer, because then if you don't make any money one year, eh, you'll make it, you know. But so this doesn't require a certification. It may require some education. I highly recommend some education um, because a farmer needs to know a lot. They need to know so much. This is not a simple thing. A farmer, generally speaking, the farmer is his own builder. Generally speaking, the farmer is his own plumber. Uh, you know, the farmer does so many different things. They oftentimes they're their own mechanics. You know, um, I always repaired my own tractors. Um, all the plumbing that's on this property that runs into the fields and does irrigation and whatever, that was all done by me. Uh, uh, other than having hired a contractor to build my one house, every other structure ever put up on this farm was put up by me. Um, now, I may have hired a helper, all right, but these things are all done by me. Uh, and so now I have this strange, diverse background of education because half of my life I worked as a musician and I was not particularly successful at that. And so to support myself, I worked as a cook, I worked as a dishwasher, I was a truck driver, I was an implement mechanic, I worked as an electrician's helper, I worked as a plumber, okay, I, I worked in the carpenter's union for 17 years, and so on and so forth. And so my background is very broad. All right, and I'm comfortable with so many different things. Well, sharpening my own chainsaws, you know, sharpening tools, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so if you don't know it now, if you start farming, you will probably learn it eventually um, because you're going to need all those things. They're really going to be important to you. Uh, the smarter you are when it comes to most basic stuff, the better off you'll be. Now, we don't really have any schools in this country that focus on organic uh, farming. All right, yeah, you have to be in places like New Zealand and that, where their educational systems are more progressive and not necessarily owned by uh, agricultural corporations to see that sort of stuff. Now, there are, um, you know, certifications organizations. There are things you can get involved in that will aid and facilitate you with this. And bringing that up, of course, there is one certification uh, out there when it comes to farming, and that's the organic certification, which is federal. That's a national law. Um, you know, I'm kind of neither here nor there on all of that. I, I, I'm glad that they made law out of it, I guess, to help regulate things. But on the other hand, I farmed organically uh, for years prior to them making this a law. Now, if I want to continue labeling my produce as organic, I have to jump through all the government's hoops. And the process is fairly expensive. Uh, all right. I'm not interested in it. Uh, so me, I just call my food uh, no spray na naturally grown, um, which it, it works for the local market here. Uh, that, that does seem to work. So they, you know, as far as that's that's about the only certification I can think of that a person may need to acquire. Um, and it will take some hoops and some education and some understanding and some time to be able to achieve that. Uh, you can generally ask more money for organic produce. 
and so there is a value. It's a value-added situation there. Uh, which, to mention that then, uh, as a farmer in Hawaii, because most of us really farm on small parcels, there are very few really big farms here on this island. Uh, the model of agriculture here is very much similar to the Japanese or Korean style. Um, we have a lot of people here, actually, that do successful farming on an acre. Um, you know, having you have 15 to 30 acres that are actually being farmed, uh, that's not at all unusual. Uh, most people who are working on more than 40 acres are doing one of two things. They're either growing coffee um, or they're raising cattle. And the cattle ranches are the biggest. We have some of the biggest cattle ranches in the United States of America here. Um, and whereas raising a cow or two for your own private use ain't a bad idea, but picking up enough land in Hawaii these days, you know, like 1,600 acres to graze uh, stock on is not that easy to do. <laughs> Pretty expensive. So, so when I refer to niche in farming, there are things that right now are... Um, drawing really, really high values. The world price on vanilla, for instance, is very high. And I'd say it's possible for a person to successfully go into vanilla farming here uh, and make a profit at it. You don't need that many acres on vanilla to be able to raise a good crop. Raising the uh, gourmet pineapples, uh, the white ones here, Oops. That's a fair market. They got a good price. There's a demand. There's never enough of them to go around. You know. Um, again, that's a, a reasonably good thing to do. Um, Hawaii has a uh, um, um, currently a medical cannabis marketplace and distribution centers, and it is possible to get involved in that program. Now that takes a lot of paperwork too. I can grow bananas and nobody cares. I can grow papayas and nobody's going to look at me. I can grow avocados till the cows come home. And it's not going to matter as long as I pay the taxes on my profit. Um, but you start getting into growing cannabis, or as we call it here, pakalolo, um, you're going to have the government up your butt constant. And you're going to need to do a lot of paperwork. and need a lot of hoops, and you may not even be able to get permits for it. The government's going to pick you and who they hand them to. But I'm sure there is significant profit in this business. Um, and I guess it'd be ground floor to help get set up over here for when the recreational cannabis does occur. Um, conservative group over there in Honolulu finally broke down and decriminalized the herb uh, as of today. So, you know, again, it's it, it's all about what is the item you have, how much do people desire it, how easy is it for them to get, and what are they willing to pay for it. And so things that are hard to get, highly desired, um, and people are willing to pay good prices to get, those are pretty good crops for a guy getting into farming on a small uh, area. Now, the farming is huge as far as what does that mean. You know, it's you could you'd be raising prawns, you could be raising catfish, you could be raising uh, beef cattle, it might be an egg ranch, you could be raising uh, tree crops, um, coffee, pineapple, sugar cane, uh, you could uh, get yourself a distillation permit, plant sugar cane of exotic heirloom varieties, and start making local rum. I mean, now, right there. That is what we call value added. You know, raising sugar cane, ugh, ain't no money in that. I mean, even C and H sugar pulled out of here because ah, it's too expensive to do that in Hawaii. And, and so they're gone. They don't raise any sugar around here anymore. They took it off to places where, you know, they can find much, much cheaper labor. But I'm aware there is a gentleman over on Maui who's a distiller who has collected all these heirloom sugarcane varieties, has been planting them out, and then he's making batches of rum from each individual variety and labeling it as such. 
I guess he's got some very interesting qualities in some of this beverage. And, um, well, there's a niche business, okay? It's a combination, but you have uh, off of a farm raising sugar cane, which is a good way to go bankrupt. Um, this guy is probably making a pretty decent pro profit, uh, and it certainly has my interest. Uh, I, I think it's an amazing idea. You know, so value added for small farm is exceedingly important. You have to be thinking this way, all right? If you want to make a living at it, if you really want to survive, any good idea that can generate a decent income in our economy can survive. Ideas that are a little bit too flaky and not focused uh, directly on is this going to profit, okay? Uh, those ideas generally fail and people walk away from them and um, go to work for McDonald's. Uh, so you're going to want to think about this one. Uh, and value added is a very, very, very important thing. I mean, it's well, like coffee farms here. Uh, some of them are just coffee farms and people all oh, get off work, uh, working as a carpenter, go home and mom and dad and the kids go out and they pick coffee cherry and then they may just sell the cherry to some of the local mills here that do the coffee and finish the process. Well, you don't make much at that and it's a lot of work. Now, coffee's well adapted, it will grow well for you and you will make some money off of it that way. But the only people around here that really make money off coffee are the ones that are not only finishing the product, in other words, it's roasted, it's ground, it's bagged, it's got a brand on it, but they probably have uh, an international presence, probably a website, probably direct-to-consumer business and distribution through local supermarkets, and you may even be doing things like entering tastings in Europe and things like this, because the wider you can spread out the base of what you've produced, the more money you're going to make on it. And so, uh, creativity, uh, initiative, uh, intelligence. <laughs> These, uh, generally, we don't really think of the farmer as being the smartest guy in the field, but I'll tell you what, dumb farmers, they don't survive. Okay, you gotta be pretty smart. Uh, so, value added, what else does that mean? Well, you're growing cacao, for instance. Now, cacao beans have a value well, if they're organically raised cacao beans, they have even more value. And that's all good. And I do believe I know exactly where to take my cacao beans on this island if I wish to get rid of them. On the other hand, it's the guys, say, like Tom Sharkey, who grow his own cacao, process the cacao, and create chocolate bars with wrappers, labels, distributed in the national parks at Haleakala and here, you know, in, on Kilauea and so on. Those are the guys that are making enough money at it to keep doing it. Yeah, value added. Um, you know, I can use your imagination. I won't go on any further with that, but think of whatever that product is. You know, how can you enhance it so when then it leaves your farm that it's leaving in a form that is ready to be presented directly to the consumer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so there's a little processing involved. Now, obviously, if you decided you're going to grow carrots, which you can do, you know, value added with a carrot is pretty much washed and bagged, <laughs> for the most part. All right. On the other hand, bear in mind that there are only a very small list of items that are legal to leave this island. All right. And that are farm crops. Uh, it's very specific. Things, you know, like macadamia nuts, they can leave the island. Things like coffee can leave the island. They're dry items, you know. Um, they don't carry pests. Um, a papaya, for instance, which you don't want to get in that business anyway, because Calavo has got that locked up. And you won't make any money on papayas here. But the papaya, to leave the island, has to be run through an irradiator. 
Well, I don't think that's what most of you are thinking of, nor would you really want to have to afford that kind of equipment and so on. And so sending fresh fruit off this island is almost impossible for most of us. Now, I can go to the other islands, and it, I'm sure Canada probably lets some of this stuff in too, because they just don't have the fruit fly issues and stuff, you know, there. Anyhow, it's mostly what California's worried about, the bugs from Hawaii getting into California and whatever. So, you know, there probably are some world markets that you could export to, but, you know, that's kind of a pain in the rear end, too. Frankly, exporting produce, oof. Um, but on the other hand, dry fruit and dry vegetable, dry herb, Dry is very easy to get off this island, all right? It doesn't have the problems. Um, seed, in general, pretty easy to get off this island. Um, nursery stock, not so hard, all right? Not so hard, not as limited. Um, with only a simple inspection from my local guys here, I can get into 46 states with nursery stock. That's all I... All that's required. You just got to take it down there to the airport, throw it on the desk, and say, look. And if they can't find any bugs worth worrying about or diseases, they stamp the box, we tape it shut, it goes to the airplane. It's very simple, actually. It's not that hard. Um, but, unfortunately, California would be, for me, one of my biggest markets. And California is very prohibitive. And I have a stack of papers in there that tell me exactly what I have to go through to get the stuff in California and it's not that bad but it requires certification so here we do have more paperwork uh, and you know more government with the nose up your rear and so on <clears throat> and you know if you want to do it it's worth the money you know it's worth doing it California is a great market uh, there are so many people over there dying to be able to buy a lot of the fruit trees and things and varieties that we raise here you know the one thing they won't let you send from this place is cactus. So forget that. Okay? <laughs> cactus, cactus fruit, forget it. I can't leave the island. They got a Puntia tussock moth quarantine here with the USDA. So, you know, some things are off the table, but most things aren't. Uh, so, I'd say if you're planning to go into farming here, diversification is probably a really good idea that has always been my ground rule with farming I've always remained diversified uh, it's the same way I invest in the market and do just about everything I don't put all my eggs in a single basket um, you know if the pineapple crop stinks this year maybe the coffee crops better or maybe I made more money on the sweet corn or the nursery business is working for me and so on so you know, I, I, I look at my money as coming from many different sources, uh, actually, as far as that goes. It really helps if you have some sort of a secondary income, whether it's from your partner or spouse, if you're planning to be a farmer here. Um, or, you know, if me, I've said, yeah, I make money on nursery, yeah, I make money on the farm, but yeah, I make money on the stock market, I'll tell you that. Uh, and so market investing, I think, sometimes is what keeps this place alive. Uh, yeah. It's important. Uh, being too focused economically in one single area uh, runs you the risk of that if that one area uh, goes sour, you're not going to be making any money. Um, so, you know, look at what are the potentials. Also, you want to look at uh, when you're, if you're planning to go into farming, you know, um, some things will uh, uh, be ready in, uh, you know, 35 days. A crop of radishes, ready to pick in no time whatsoever. Um, you know, a crop of sweet corn, 80 to 90 days maybe. You do several crops back to back here in a year on, on that. Um, well, on the other hand, if you want to plant pineapples, which is a great crop here, takes two years, you know. Um, so what are you going to do in the meantime? If it's coffee, eh, it's four to five. Oh, that's how we got into pineapples, was we put two pineapples between every coffee plant. That way it was only half the time to getting some income off the field, see. 
Uh, and so you need to look at that idea. I think it's very important that you stage yourself. You know, people want to grow, I want to grow fruit trees. They, you know, uh, you want to grow mame sapote. Well, I've sitting 10 years on a mame tree here. It's still growing and it ain't made a piece of fruit yet. And so if I had planted, uh, you know, two acres of mame uh, 15 years ago, um, I'd still be making no money. See what I'm getting at? Uh, you really have to be looking at this. Uh, you know, bananas are fast, but bananas aren't worth anything. They're a great crop here. I love them. I always have bananas around, and I grow them mostly just for me. The only place I make any money on those bananas is, again, value added as dried bananas sold on my website. There I make a little bit of money. Not much, because it's a lot of work to pick cut dry the bananas okay well, I don't make a lot but it helps me get rid of the extra bananas when you got a 50 pound stalk and I grew it for myself to eat well Ellen and I can maybe manage to get through maybe 10 pounds of those bananas before they go bad the other 40 pounds has to go to the dehydrator no yeah, that's the way it is and so just the fact that I don't throw them out uh, is a good thing and that happens a lot on the farm too There'll be a lot of things that you do that probably take you more labor than it's worth to be able to produce them. You know, it's uh, uh, vanilla is, you know, a lot of labor. It's um, not heavy, not hard, tedious, a uh, very tedious situation. And it's timely. You have to be on it at the moment. So I don't know if that helps anybody out there who's thinking about this stuff. Um, I highly recommend you do not romanticize farming in Hawaii. It's not romantic when the pigs break through the fences and eat all your sweet potatoes. Not romantic. Mm -mm. Smell a pig poop all over what was your field. Not romantic at all. Uh, when you've been sitting there waiting on them avocados to get ripe and the pigs finished off everything on every lower limb overnight. Not romantic. Mm -mm. You want to kill? <laughs> Yeah, I want to bite into pig jugglers with my bare teeth. I want to rip pork flesh. It's like that. I get angry about it sometimes. Yeah. I have my days where I have absolutely no qualms about placing a bullet in something. Yeah. It's like that. So, yeah, farming can get like that. A lot of you guys who are gardeners, you know, and, oh, you put up with the squirrels, you put up with the attack from the birds, and whatever. You know, I've heard this over the years. I've been browbeat for killing gophers, you know. I've been browbeat by people for killing squirrels. Oh, they're so cute. Well, I'll tell you what. It's the difference, really, between a farmer and a gardener, all right? Some gardeners have that mindset, but most of them are like, oh, I can eat it from the supermarket. Let the squirrels have it. Well, if you're a farmer, you can't let them have it. You know, if you do, you just lost your business, you lost all your income, and so on. And so there's a certain amount of being a farmer that ain't so nice and it ain't so friendly. You know, heard about the um, farmers with the shotgun loaded in rock salt getting the guys in the watermelon patch. I sure as heck have been dusted as a kid stealing pumpkins <laughs> in Illinois. Yeah. You know, so, you know, the farmers, they got a stake in it, you know, and they're serious about it. And so it's not necessarily always a lot of fun, nor can you always be Mr. Nice Guy. If you are a pacifist, whew, I don't know, good luck being a farmer. I, I, I guess there must be a way. There, there must be a way, you know. So, but I, I would personally find it very difficult to succeed as a farmer if you're afraid to control other creatures, uh, which basically means dispatching them when you need to. Because you can't negotiate with a rodent. You don't negotiate with hungry birds, you know. The best you can do sometimes is deter them, you know. But even still, I get tired of nets for birds and stuff like this, and they don't work all that well anyway. I'm more inclined to just want to take a pellet gun and blast every cardinal and mine a bird that comes, that goes after my uh, blueberries. I hope that helps a little. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what to tell 
people on these questions about farming in Hawaii. You know, by and large, you don't need any paperwork, you need no permits, you don't need anything, darn it, just make sure you're paying your taxes and you need a piece of land to work on and then this is m most important right here. And it's not just what you know and what you will learn, it's your attitude towards it that's going to drive this whole project to success if you decide to do it. Um, but if you're just looking for a way to make a living, nah, I get a job in medicine or, or, or in industry or anywhere else. You know, it's a risky business. It has its satisfactions, but it's a risky way to make a living, and it's hard work, too. I've noticed that, again, with a lot of folks that have had a, uh, a better upbringing, people who didn't have to shovel manure <laughs> and so on, uh, that when they're exposed to this situation, the usual comment is, wow, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Yeah. It's the reason at my age that I'm still in fairly good condition health-wise. Um, it's mostly all that hard work keeps me active. I'm out here all the time. Now, I do spend some time sitting in front of YouTube, too. That's late in the day once farm work's all done. Then I relax. Aloha. You all have a wonderful 2020.